Amen. 531 in your hymnal. 531. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. 531. Let's all stand together as we sing. All oh, hail the power. On that first together. All oh, hail the power of today, maybe tonight, amen. and uh, we'll see. That'll be okay, wouldn't it? And uh, even John said amen. Wow, I tell you what, that's amen. tough. I, he's getting married Friday. I, I'll be honest, I'm not sure I'd have said that five days before I got married. I had just the way it is, And uh, but praise the Lord. He's more spiritual than I was, and uh, amen. Good to see you in church tonight. Thanks for being back on Sunday evening. Let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And thank you, God, for loving us and helping us. Thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you for the decisions that were made for thee today. And, Father, we ask you to meet with us again tonight and speak to our hearts. Give us what we need from your word. I pray you'd bless the music, our fellowship together this evening. May you use it in each one of our hearts and lives, Lord. Draw us closer to Jesus because we've been here in church this evening. It's in his name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 340 in your hymnal. 340, oh, what a Savior that he died for me. Verily, verily. 340, let's sing that first all together. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me.
All right, a few announcements now. And uh, right after the service this evening, we need to have, my wife needs to have a nursery workers meeting, the ladies who help in the nursery. Uh, why don't you come to the choir right after service, all right, up in the choir loft, and we'll have the meeting right there, right after the service tonight. And it uh, won't take but a few minutes if we all get up there on time. And uh, But some important things to cover as far as our nursery goes, all right? And then uh, remember on October, well, first of all, we better go this Friday, don't we, huh? There's a wedding this Friday. John and Emily, stand up for us, all right? This is the couple, as long as I can't talk them out of it before Friday. And uh, <laughs> they're going to be getting married Friday, 4.30, correct? 4.30 on Friday afternoon. And uh, you've, most of you have signed up to, to attend that. And um, if you didn't sign up and you want to attend, I'd suggest you see Brother and Mrs. Moreland after the service and let them know that you plan on being here. Uh, but that'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, that's this Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon, all right? And uh, so that'll be, that'll be great, a great thing. And then uh, otherwise, Wednesday night service and uh, Thursday night down at London. Boy, we had a good night Thursday night down at London. Had 48 men there. And uh, had 17 men receive Christ their Savior. It was uh, it was an incredible night. Had 23 new guys, first time there, and uh, really really exciting times. So I uh, continue to pray for that ministry there, in London, and then uh, I mean in CRC, and then out at London on Saturday morning, and uh, the uh, visitation at 10 o'clock on Saturday as usual, and uh, we'll be right into next Sunday already. Now on the 10th is the bonfire, the hayride down at the Manning uh, Farm. The sign-up sheet, sign sheet for that is down there as well. Follow the instructions on the page, if you will. And then, ladies, take a note. Your ladies' night out is the 19th of October. I think originally was for the 12th. We pushed that back a week till the 19th. And uh, you're going to be, that'll be here at the church, and uh, you'll have a uh, fall theme with that, a harvest theme, and you're going to be, uh, you're going to be making a, a small gift that uh, you're going to be able, they're going to be able to take to the nursing home, uh, the nursing home ministry, and give to the those who they minister to there. So you'll be doing that on your ladies' night out on the 19th, okay? And uh, I think there'll be a sign-up sheet for that as well soon, and you'll be able to get uh, signed up for that night out. All right. Now let's take a moment. Anybody visiting tonight? Looking around to see if we have anybody? I think it's just uh, mostly us-ins. All right. And... Uh, very good. Very good. Let's take a minute. We'll hear from the choir.
413 in your hymnal. 413, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But then love lifted me. 413, isn't that good news? On that first together, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Two, two, three together. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. Draw me near, 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 blessed Lord. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing 223 together on that first. I am thine, O Lord.
of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. On that last together. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I One more time without the piano. On that last chorus together. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy cross. Be seated. Great singing tonight. Often just listen to those voices singing. That's a wonderful thing. But I realize if everybody did that, we wouldn't hear anything. So somebody's got to keep singing, I guess. And uh, it sure sounds good, though. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, time for the offering tonight. Let's give as the Lord has blessed us and prospered us and uh, give out of love for him. Amen. And uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our offering tonight. Brother Danny Wright, lead us in our prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for another opportunity to come to your house and learn of, of your son, Jesus. Lord, we love you, and we pray that each person in this room would build a personal, intimate, real, life-changing relationship with you, Father. We love you, and we need you. Without you, Father, we're nothing. Be with the pastor as he opens up the only book you've ever written and teaches us about our, about our Savior. And we'll thank you for it, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen.
take your Bible this evening, I want you to get two places. I want you to get Psalm 111, if you would please. Psalm 111 and John 17. Psalm 111 and John 17. Make it John 7 instead of 17. Would you do that? Just take the one off that and make it John 7. I was looking at the verse I wanted and I, I got it. John 7. We're going to start in Psalms and then we'll read the verse over in John, all right? We'll start in Psalm 111. <clears throat> and then we'll turn over to John and read a verse there. All right, let's stand together for the reading of the scripture tonight. The verse in Psalm 111 is verse number 10. And I want us to read that in unison. Verse number 10 of Psalm 111. Ready? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. And then turn over to John 7. And verse number 17. John 7 and verse number 17, please. And let's read that together as well. Ready? If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of these scriptures here this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to prepare our hearts, that we'd be ready to receive the truth from your word that you have for us tonight. Lord, thank you for the wonderful music this evening, and it's been a, it sure has been a blessing to us to sing these songs. I trust it's been a sweet savor to you as our praises have come up to thee. And Lord, I pray that you'd be pleased now with the special and with the preaching of your word tonight. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee When Jesus touched those blinded eyes and made them see And though I did not see the empty tomb that day I still believe for I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb, and I believe there is healing in the touch of His hand. But the greatest of all miracles is when my Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I haven't seen the lowest sin, sick soul. Have life anew and be made pure, pure and whole. And I have felt him lose the chains of sin and set my spirit free. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb, and I believe there is healing in the touch of His head. But the greatest of all miracles was when my Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Now, Heavenly Father, we bow in prayer this evening as we come to the preaching of your word. 
And Lord, I pray that you would give me your help tonight as we give this message, and please help each person as they listen tonight to the message. I would like to be a help, I would like to be an encouragement to the people of God. And I pray you give me clarity as we try to communicate the truth from your word. Holy Spirit, be the master teacher and take the truth to the hearts of your people. We love you. We thank you for the Bible tonight. Use it in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I wanted to talk to you tonight on this subject when I don't understand. You know, a lot of times... I hear this statement, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard it in 33 years of being in the ministry, I think I'd be a wealthy man. Uh, I just don't understand why, and then fill in the blank with a thousand things. I don't understand why, uh, or, or, or I don't understand what's so wrong about, and it could be rock music, it could be the, any kind of the wrong music, it could be movies, it could be taking a drink, it could be immodest dress on men or women, it could be the King James Bible, it could be being faithful to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, I, I don't, uh, tithing, I just don't understand why we have to do this, or why we can't do this, or why, and you can fill in a thousand different things that people say to fill in that blank. I want to help you for when you don't understand something, okay? By the way, let me clarify it. I want to help you when you don't understand something, but you want to understand it. There are some people who don't understand something and they don't want to understand it. And I can't help you, okay? Uh, your mind's made up, I'm not going to change your mind. But if you want to understand, I, I want you to listen carefully tonight and I can give you some help, I think. And, and I will say this, don't, don't, don't think the reason you don't understand some of those things is because you're not spiritual enough. Okay? That's not, don't let someone talk down to you and say, well, when you become as spiritual as I, then you'll get these things. You know, I, you pardon me if I throw up. Uh, that's, that's not the attitude to have. And that's, that's the Pharisee coming out in you, not the Christian coming out in you. But I want to give you a, I don't intend to keep you long, and um, I don't always do what I intend to do, but I hope to keep that promise to you tonight. Uh, but three simple principles to help you this evening when you don't quite understand why you should do something or why you should not do something in the Christian life. Number one is, and this is the verses we read this evening, number one, you can jot this down, doing God's will comes first and understanding follows. Doing God's will comes first and understanding follows. The verse we read over in John chapter 7 and verse number 17, did you notice the Bible said, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. We, we would rather have it, I'll know the doctrine and then I'll do his will. We would reverse that order. But God does not reverse that order. He said doing His will comes first and knowing or understanding the doctrine follows that. Look at Psalm 111 and verse 10, the other verse we read this evening. And He said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now watch this. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. Doing the commandment is the key to having a good understanding. You don't get the understanding first, you get the commandment first, and then you get the understanding. You're not going to really ever understand a separated life until you live a separated life. You're never going to understand faithfulness until you live faithfulness. You're never really going to understand holiness until you live holiness. If I'm going to understand, I must first obey. Psalm 34 and verse 8, it's a very familiar verse to you because I'll start it and you'll be able to finish it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When Andy was young, 
he still is, I think. And, uh, but when he was a boy, I recall that we had soup one day, and it was broccoli, cheese, and rice in it. We wanted Andy to have some soup. He didn't want to have any soup. He didn't like the way it looked. And of course, my wife can be pretty persuasive. And her, her, her reason was, just taste it. Just taste it. You'll like it. And, and he didn't want to taste it because he didn't like the way it looked. Now, you can't tell whether you like something by the way it looks. Come on now. You can't, you can't taste it with your eyes. Okay? You have, to, you have to commit to it and put it into your mouth. Okay? And uh, boy, uh, Moreland's are shaking. <laughs> and Moreland's thinking, man, I've seen some stuff. Yeah, I know. You know talk about the mission field. They, you know what you learn? You learn never ask what it is. Just if they offer it to you, you say, here we go. And uh, it, it's going in. But, but, but he finally, he was such an obedient child. He, he took a bite of it. He took a taste of it. And guess what? He liked it. And he ate the soup, and I think he even had seconds. He finally tasted, and he saw that the soup was good. But you see, he would have missed out on something that he liked and that he enjoyed because he never would have been willing to commit himself to it. You have to commit yourself to have it, and once you do that, you find out you like it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Until you taste what the Lord has, it's, until you taste a life consecrated to God and dedicated to Him, then you'll never know what it's like. You have to commit yourself to that. You have to surrender yourself to that and get a taste for what holiness is, get a taste of how good God is, get a taste of what God made you for, Get a taste of fellowship with God and you'll find that you'll like it. That you'll enjoy it. That this is the kind of life you've been looking for. You, you'll find that if you separate yourself to God and separate yourself from the things of the world, you're going to find out that you like that. You're going to find out that that's a good life and it's very, very good. You know, years ago, I used to like Ryan's Steakhouse. You ever eaten at Ryan's Steakhouse? I mean at Ryan's. Yeah, quite a few of you have. Not, I don't think there's anyone real local here. I think there's a few up in the north part of Columbus. It's similar to uh, the one down here on Stringtown. Yeah, Golden Corral. It's a similar type thing. And, and I used to love going to Ryan's Steakhouse and, and enjoyed their steak and the buffet and all that. And, and that was real good until, until somebody took me to Longhorn Steakhouse. Once I had Longhorn Steakhouse, I didn't care to go to Ryan's anymore. I, I, I found something that was better, and, and, and I thought Ryan's just didn't have the same appeal to me anymore. That's how it is. Listen, that's how it is when you get a taste of a life that's surrendered to God, a life that's totally sold out to God. I mean, where you're, where, where you're 100% in, you'll find that, hey, I don't, what I, the way I used to live, that doesn't appeal to me anymore. That doesn't have a draw for me anymore. I found something much, much better. So, you don't have to, you, you don't, if you say, I don't understand why I can't listen to this music, or I don't understand why I can't watch this program, or I can't understand why I can't go to this movie, or why I can't go here or go there, I just don't understand this separated Christian life you guys talk about. What you have to do is you have to obey the separation, and you'll begin to understand the separation. But you have to taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to do the commandment and the understanding will follow. And you'll get to understand. Let me give you principle number two. Without obedience to God, we have nothing to compare with what the world offers. 
I mentioned Ryan's Steakhouse a minute ago, and then, of course, going to Longhorn. And, and, and boy, once you have the ribeye at Longhorn, then you never go back to, to Ryan's. That, that, that doesn't. It's, it's like I, I in, in high school, I drove a Volkswagen. How many ever had the privilege of owning a Volkswagen? Okay, all right. I mean, the, the bug, you know, and, uh, and the uh, driving that, and, and that was great. And then when we were, my, my, uh, shortly before we were married, my grandfather passed away, and uh, we inherited his Maverick. Remember the car called a Maverick? Had a Maverick, that's what I went to college with. And, um, and then, just before we graduated college and we were going out west, my father-in-law showed up. And he got a got us a Buick LeSabre. That wasn't new, but I'm telling you, it was smooth. It wasn't a Volkswagen. You know, this thing was gliding down the highway. You see, listen, we think what we have is good because we have nothing to compare it with. You understand? We think what we have is great, but we've never had anything better. So we don't know what to compare it to. You think being single is great. I'll report to you being married is better. John, you may think being single is great. And I'm sure you've enjoyed it. Being married is much better. You're going to enjoy this. Emily, I don't know what to say to you. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) It'll be great. It'll be great. But here's the thing. If I don't commit myself to, if I don't commit myself to Longhorn, I'll always be satisfied at Ryan's. If I don't commit myself to the Buick LeSabre, I'll always be satisfied with the Volkswagen. If I don't commit myself to marriage and a marriage relationship, I'll always be content being by myself. You see, you too many Christians are satisfied with what they have because they don't realize what they're missing. They've never, they've never committed themselves to living out and out for God. So they, all they know is what, they, what they've been doing. They don't know anything different. There's how many, how many folks that come on a Friday night to the Reformers Unanimous and, and, and you know what they think? I'll never get out of this life. I'll always be in bondage to this, this addiction. I'll always be in bondage to these stubborn habits. I'll never be free. Oh, wretched man that I am. And yes, Paul said that, but Paul also said... Uh, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. He found the answer. And he got deliverance. They, you see, don't, the, the Christian life was never intended to be half, halfway in. Jesus called it being lukewarm in the book of Revelation. Jesus said, when, when, when you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, that's, that's, that, that's, that has to be the Lord's perspective. It wouldn't be mine. You say, preacher, would you have somebody who's, who's you know, hot for God? Absolutely. Everybody wants somebody, what we call, on fire for God. The Bible just calls him, he's, he's hot. Okay? But then he said, or would you like to have somebody who's completely cold? Doesn't want to come to church, doesn't want anything to do with God, doesn't want anything to do with living for God? Or would you rather have somebody who would show up occasionally at church? Doesn't, doesn't tithe faithfully, but every now and then will put some money in the plate. And he's just there somewhat. You know what? I'd say, well, I'll take something. But God says, I don't. God says, it's that halfway guy that makes me sick. That's what Elijah said was on the mountain, wasn't it? He said, hey, if God be God, do what? Serve Him. But if Baal be God, serve Him. But you can't do both. 
You can't be halt between two opinions. And so people who turn their nose up at living righteous and living holy and living sold out for God, it's because they never fully surrendered themselves to fully live for God. And if you did it and you said, all right, I, that's it, I'm, I'm selling out to God. He's going to have everything and I'm giving it all to Him. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. I'm going to take that step. You're going to find out you'll like it. You're going to find out it's a pretty good life. You will like it. You'll never know the wrong of the rock music or the rap music or the country music or the contemporary Christian music. That's kind of an oxymoron. Until you, until you get out of the river and get into the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs. If you don't know what that means, some of you do know what it means and you need to get out of the river. You're going down the river without a paddle. I committed to godly music when I was 18 years of age. And I'm more than 18 years of age now. And you know what I find out? I like it. I like godly music. I enjoy it. I look forward to, I hope you enjoyed the songs tonight. Don't you like being in church? I love hearing the music. I love singing the songs. I had, I had, a, are you washed in the blood? On my mind all week. Over and over again, I get been to Jesus for the cleansing. Man, what stuck? You ever get songs stuck in your head? There it was all week long. Man, I making the schedule of music out for Sunday, and I said, "Man, I'm gonna put that in there." I walked in the office this morning, and there's there's the order of service sitting on my desk, and Brother Bob Reed has a note on there and an arrow pointing to, "Are you washing the blood?" He said, "The choir's singing this song this morning." That's where it stuck in my head. I heard the choir singing it, probably. And it stayed with me. But that's good. I want those songs in my head. I want those songs in my heart. And I find I like it. Doing comes first. Understanding follows. Without obedience to God, you have nothing to compare to the world. You know, churches, that's where churches make the mistake, I, I think. You know, you... The, the, the church, by the way, the very, the very word means a called out assembly. Called out from where? The world. So if I bring the world in with us, if you come in and I brought the world in, we've really ceased to be called ourselves a church. Maybe that's why a lot of the contemporary places don't want to be called churches. They shy away from that. They want to call it a center or a you know, uh, just a, a word and they don't want to stay away from church. And, and that's probably okay because at least they're being honest with what they are. This isn't where you want to come. This shouldn't be a place where you have to come and fight off the world. This is a refuge from the world. This is what church ought to be like. Let me give you statement number three. We obey because He is the Lord. We obey because He is the Lord. Luke chapter 6. Would you look there please? Luke chapter 6. The Bible has all the answers. It really does. You, you may not have specific things, but it's going to give you a principle that will help deal with your situation. But you can also learn a lot from the questions of the Bible. And there's a question the Lord Jesus gives here that we certainly can learn much from. Verse number 46. Jesus asked this question, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? In other words, it's hypocritical for me to call Jesus Lord if I'm not going to do what He tells me to do. He's the boss. I need to do what I'm told to do. Well, I don't, I don't see why I have to do that, Pastor. I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Well, let me tell you my thoughts about that. 
Well, man, I know you said, but listen, the world thinks that's stupid. Well, listen, if my feelings are my final authority, then I can't call Jesus Lord. If my thoughts are my final authority, I can't call Jesus Lord. If my comfort is my final authority, I can't call Jesus Lord. If my convenience is my final authority, then I cannot call Jesus Lord. And certainly if the world and what they think is my final authority, I sure can't call Him Lord. When I was a teenager, I had a midnight curfew. Had to be in by midnight. My dad always said, nothing good happens after midnight. It, so I always had to be in. You think I was tough? My sister had to be in 1130. That's not fair. You tell my dad that. Do you think I looked at my dad and said, well, dad, when I understand why you give me a 12 o'clock curfew, I'll obey it. I'd have, I'd have gotten an attitude adjustment. What, what was called an attitude adjustment. The Board of Education applied to the seat of knowledge. And I would have got that. I did not say that to my father. I obeyed what he told me to do. I simply obeyed. Why would you obey? Because he's the boss. He's my dad. And I knew, hey, I knew these things about my dad. I knew he loved me. I knew he wasn't out to hurt me. Okay? I knew he was smarter than I was. He lived a lot longer. I knew he had a good reason. And you know what the fifth thing was? I always liked the results when I obeyed what he told me to do. I didn't like the results when I didn't obey. Let me ask you a question. Does God love you? Would he intentionally hurt you? No. Is he smarter than you? Mm -hmm. Does God probably have a good reason for when he tells you to do something? Do you like the outcome? Do you like the result when you obey God and do what He tells you to do? Yeah. Look at Luke chapter 5. You're, you're right in Luke 6. Just go back a page, would you? Maybe two, depending on how your Bible's laid out. Luke 5, Jesus said, it says it came to pass, verse 1, it came to pass that His people pressed upon Him, that's Jesus, to hear the Word of God. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And there entered one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him. He would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. They beckoned unto their partners that were in the other ship. They should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. It's an amazing story. These men fished all night and didn't catch anything. Morning comes, the crowds have gathered to hear Jesus teach the Word of God. Won't that be a great time? But you imagine when we get to heaven, we'll get to sit around and listen to Jesus teach us the Word of God. What a, what a time that must have been. Jesus asked for a boat, and one of them had to be Simon Peter's. They're, they're cleaning their nets from the night, having not caught anything, getting ready to go out the next night. And, and, and he says, let me borrow your boat. And he goes out a little bit from the shore so we can speak to all the people. And when he's done, he brings the boat and he says, now take your boats out there and let down your nets for a draught of fishes, a great catch of fish. Peter had an excuse. He said, we toiled all night and we've taken nothing. 
You think Jesus didn't know that? You ever, you ever tell God something that you think you're kind of filling them in on the details of what's going on in your life and like he doesn't know what's happening? That's what Peter did. But he said something very important. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. I'm going to ask you a question. Did it make sense to Peter? Did, do you think the thought crossed his mind? You were a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. You know about the wood stuff. I know about fish. It, it may have crossed his mind. But you know what? It did, he didn't say, well, it seems to me. He didn't say, I just don't get it. I don't understand. Or the way I see it. Or my thoughts on the matter. Or he just said, it's your word. I'm letting down the net. Now, he should have let down the nets, plural, like Jesus asked him to. Jesus said, plural, nets. Because Jesus knew how many fish he had said to jump into that net. They only let down a net and they found out they had more fish than the net could hold. The net was breaking. And they had to call the other boat over to help them and they filled both boats up with fish. So much fish, so many fish, they were ready to sink. Peter grabbed the knees of Jesus and said, I'm a sinful man. Let me ask you a question. You think he liked the results of obeying Jesus? Sure did. He knew Jesus loved him. He knew Jesus would not hurt him. He knew Jesus was smarter than he was. He knew that Jesus had a good reason to tell him to launch out and let down the nets. And he sure liked the result of obeying Jesus and doing what he told him to do. Three simple principles I want you to remember. Doing God's will comes first. Understanding will follow. When you're not sure about I don't know about this. Just do what God says to do. Your understanding will follow. Without obedience, number two, without obedience to God, we have nothing to compare with what the world offers. Number three, we obey because He is the Lord. The way you understand a holy consecrated life to God where you're sold out to Him is to commit yourself to it yield yourself to God present yourself a living sacrifice to God and say I'm all in and you'll find out it's the life you've been looking for it's the life you want to live oh taste and see that the Lord is good and when you don't understand you commit yourself to doing what God tells you to do the songwriter said, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of Thy love. The next verse says, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. How beautiful the feet of them that bring, preach the gospel. Take glad tidings of peace. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Not, hey, not always only for my country music singer. Take my lips and let them sing always only for my king. Always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee. Not gossip about somebody else. Messages for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. You say, God, it's yours. Not mine. I'm not, I'm not holding on to it. And okay, God, pry it out of my hand. Leave an open hand and say, God, everything I have is open-handed. Just like Job, the Lord gave and the Lord take away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Because I know He loves me. I know He's not going to do anything to hurt me. I know He's smarter than I am. You understand what God's doing. He said, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own, and it shall be thy royal throne. 
Who's on the throne of your heart? Who should be on the throne of your heart? It's not a two-seated throne. It's only room for one person there. It needs to be the Lord Jesus. And then he concludes by saying, Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. Now is that a song you sing? Or is that a prayer you'll offer to God? Saying that'll be my prayer. I want to be ever only all for thee. You know, Lot was awful miserable in Sodom. And he was miserable because he wasn't all in. He was trying to straddle the fence between pleasing Christ and pleasing himself and pleasing the world. And the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation, the filthy behavior of the wicked. That's exactly where some Christians are living tonight. And you think, man, this Christian life is just not very enjoyable. It's hard. I've got to be in church, and I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I'm supposed to do this, and I'm supposed to do that. I can't do all this. You just need to sell out. You just need to consecrate yourself. You need to understand. It's not you doing it anyway. He'll, it's according to the power that works in us. The power of the Holy Spirit of God. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit of God took up residence in your body. And He's there. He's the paraclete. He's the one called alongside to help you. God never intended for you to try it in your own strength or in your own power. You'll be frustrated. You'll fail. You must ask for His help. Ask for His power. Consecrate yourself. Give yourself to God. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will ever be ever only all for thee. Ever only all for thee. When you don't understand, obey. Do what God tells you to do. The understanding will come. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, I'm thankful tonight that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. And sometimes, Lord, forgive us when we think we have to understand why we do something or why you've told us to do something. And we want to try to figure it out instead of just obey. And the understanding will come. You made the truth clear in your word. And Lord, there might be some folks listening this evening that are struggling. This idea that some of the things they, they've been holding back and not doing some things they know that you have plainly said to do because they don't understand why they should do that. And I pray that tonight they just simply consecrate themselves to you. They would commit themselves to tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. That a complete surrender to you is not a hard thing. It's not a difficult thing. It's not, it's not a, that you're not a hard taskmaster. You're a loving Heavenly Father. As we were reminded of at the missions conference, you're a good God who does good things. Lord, I pray that you'd help those people this evening who are struggling to bow the knee and consecrate themselves, Lord, to Thee. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'm going to finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this evening that say, Pastor, I, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat this evening, and He did speak to my heart. And there's some areas that I've just been wanting to understanding before I'll obey. And I understand tonight, God spoke to my heart, I need to obey. And He'll give me the understanding. I just need to do it. He he loves me, He's not going to hurt me, He's smarter than I am. He knows what's best for me, and 
and, and, and I like the outcome. I wonder how many believers here tonight would say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart, and I want to be consecrated to the Lord. I want to obey Him. Will you slip your hand up, Christian, and say, Pastor, pray for me tonight? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to Him this evening. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hey, hey, if you're not going to live for God now, if you're not going to be sold out for Him now, when, when, when is it going to happen? When, when, what, what will it take? Why don't you bow the knee? You'll never regret that day. Heavenly Father, have your way now in each heart and life, and thank you for hands that have been uplifted, indicating you've spoken to our hearts this evening. And I pray that simply each of us would obey what you've told us to do in our heart, and holy decisions would be made for you at this altar this evening. May your will be done in every heart and life. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart this evening. I want you to respond to him. Take my life and That's let right. it be consecrated, Lord, to Verse over again, Bob, and let's sing it with him, all right? Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Treasure store. Take myself and I will be. Father, I pray you'd help us to be ever, only, all for thee. Lord, I pray that we'd always be consecrated to thee. And that, Lord, you would be the Lord of our life, sitting on the throne of our heart. We would obey you this week and follow, follow your commands. Do what we know you want us to do, even if we don't fully understand. And I'm believing you that the understanding will follow. Lord, help us not to say... Let me see and I'll believe. Help us to believe and we shall see. So, Father, help us to walk by faith and not by sight this week. We love you. We know that you love us, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a good God to us. Thank you for a wonderful Lord's Day here in the, in, in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the gathering of the church. I pray, Lord, you use us now as we leave this place and we go out into the world. Help others to see Christ in us. May our light so shine that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Help us to give the gospel to people this week. May souls be saved. 
Lord, I pray we'll be about our Father's business through the week. Make us mindful of your presence with us as we leave this place tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. And ladies, as soon as we're done, make your way right up to the choir loft, would you please? Nursery workers. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are just...